In today's video on clinical reasoning, I'll be discussing cognitive bias. So to start off, what is cognitive bias? The word bias by itself has a few definitions. One dictionary defines bias as prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. Bias is seen as a universally negative thing. No one wants to be accused of bias, nor do they want to feel that they are prone to committing bias themselves. Compare the general definition of bias to the concept of cognitive bias in clinical reasoning. Any tendency for a clinician to favor one particular viewpoint over another in a way that's not fully supported by logic or data, and which is not solely accounted for by a gap in medical knowledge. It's still a negative phenomenon, but it doesn't and shouldn't have the same degree of negative connotation about the person committing it. Cognitive bias is a universal, natural phenomenon, and in order to combat it, we first need to accept it influences all clinicians to some extent. Why do we care about cognitive bias in clinical reasoning? We care because it is one of the most notable factors that contribute to misdiagnosis. Some of these factors that contribute to misdiagnosis can be categorized as clinician factors, things that just depend on us. In addition to cognitive bias, this also includes incomplete medical knowledge. For example, our illness scripts for a disease might be too incomplete, and the inaccurate interpretation of diagnostic tests. Some factors are system factors, like miscommunication between healthcare providers, inaccurate data, a particularly obvious example of which is a lab error, Inaccurate data also includes something called chart lore, which is when a symptom, test result, or diagnosis is erroneously entered into the medical chart and is subsequently copy and pasted forward over multiple encounters before the error is caught. Another system factor is overwhelming clinical volume in which clinicians simply are not given adequate time for accurate assessment and investigation. And last in this category is delayed follow-up. A primary care clinician might think the patient has a gastric ulcer and refer them for an EGD to confirm it, but if the EGD can't be scheduled in a timely fashion, the fact that the patient actually could have gastric cancer will go unrecognized. And we also have patient factors. Most notably, the patient simply has an unusual disease presentation. Patient factors also include situations in which patients deliberately withhold relevant historical details, for example, not disclosing drug use or sexual activity for which they might fear being judged. In real life situations, diagnostic errors rarely fall neatly into one of these nine categories. And usually there is more than one contributing factor. For example, chart lore was categorized as an example of a system factor, yet somehow that mistake must have entered the chart to begin with, most likely a result of clinician error. As another example, the patient factor of an unusual disease presentation has a lot of overlap with the clinician's potentially incomplete medical knowledge about that disease. There are ways in which clinicians can address all of these factors. For example, system factors can be addressed via quality improvement projects, improving patient-clinician communication through deliberate practice with standardized patient actors can help address problems surrounding patients who don't fully disclose all historical details. But it's really cognitive bias and to a lesser extent, the other clinician factors, which fall most clearly into the general realm of clinical reasoning. To get an idea about how cognitive bias can lead to misdiagnosis, consider an experiment that I've been running for a number of years at Stanford Medical School. During one of our few mandatory lectures in the spring semester first year, where everyone is present and a captive audience, I have two cases distributed to the students. Half the room gets case A, and half the room gets case B. Students are given sufficient time to read their case to themselves in its entirety and decide what they think is the single most likely diagnosis. What they don't know is that case A and case B are the same patient, a 60-year-old man presenting with shortness of breath for two days. And these two histories include the exact same information. After the students have chosen their diagnosis, I take a class poll, one side at a time. I ask those students with case A to select which of the following diagnoses they committed to. Pneumonia, a COPD exacerbation, a pulmonary embolism, lung cancer, heart failure, or something not listed. I then repeat the same question 
for the students who were given case B. And here are the results tabulated from three successive years, 2016 to 2018. The majority of students given case A select a COPD exacerbation with a minority choosing PE or pneumonia. And among those students given case B, the overwhelming majority of them chose PE. This was a consistent finding and each year had the same phenomenon happen. But I said that the two cases contained the same information. So why did this happen? The answer lies in where the information is presented in the note. In case A, which most people thought was a COPD exacerbation, the history of COPD is listed prominently within the chief complaint, whereas in case B, it's just listed in the past medical history. In case B, which most people thought was a PE, a history of a recent leg injury is listed in the chief complaint, while in case A, that information is buried in the social history. Case A places a sick contact in the history of present illness, while case B inappropriately places it under the review of systems. And the smoking history is in the HPI of case A and under social history in case B. Both case A students and case B students were given the same information that logically should have had the same impact on the reasoning process, but because that information was presented in a different order, they reached different conclusions. This is classic cognitive bias, one that is sometimes called the primacy effect, in which information presented first is recalled the best and thus has the greatest weight given to it. There are three other common types of cognitive bias I want to focus on. First is anchoring bias. This is when a clinician places excessive weight on a specific feature of the presentation learned early on and determines the probability of diagnostic considerations based on how strongly they are associated with that one feature. This is similar to confirmation bias, which is when a clinician places excessive weight on a specific diagnosis and determines how much weight to place on subsequently learned information based on how much that information confirms that originally suspected diagnosis. So information that confirms the clinician's initial hypothesis is accepted, while information that refutes the hypothesis is relatively discounted. And last is momentum bias, also known as diagnostic momentum. This is when a clinician prematurely accepts a diagnosis as accurate that had already been attached to the patient without being adequately skeptical or without reaching his or her own conclusions. To see how these biases and a few others might play out in real life, let's look at a reenactment of a scenario that I've seen as a hospitalist. Imagine a 65-year-old man with a history of diabetes and anxiety who was brought to the ER by ambulance after developing difficulty breathing during a family argument. When the paramedics drop him off, they communicate the patient's symptom and medical history to the ER nurse, along with his vitals and whatever treatments were given en route. They conclude their sign-out process by saying to the nurse, given the situation in which the patient became ill, his lack of chest pain, and his history of anxiety, his breathing problems don't seem to be cardiac in origin. Probably just needs a Xanax and some rest. The ER nurse proceeds to conduct her own assessment, retaking the history, and re-examining the patient. While doing so, even if she's consciously trying to stay as objective as possible in reaching her own conclusions, in the back of her mind, she still may be thinking, probably a panic attack. She performs an ECG on the patient, which looks for abnormal heart rhythms or signs of a heart attack, and then brings all that information to the ER doctor. The nurse tells the doc, the patient is a 65-year-old man with bad anxiety and some diabetes, who was in a heated argument with his daughter during which he developed shortness of breath. He has no chest pain, vitals are stable, and on exam, he just looks anxious. It seems like maybe a panic attack. Here's his ECG. It looks unremarkable. At this point, the ER doctor also interviews and examines the patient, confirms the patient has no chest pain, and the doctor takes note of the unremarkable ECG. The doctor is thinking about the possibility of a heart problem, but thinks to himself, without chest pain and with a reassuring ECG, his breathing problems are probably not from a heart attack. And he's also thinking about the patient's history of anxiety, which supports the initial theory of a panic attack. <laughs> 
some of this is conscious, deliberate thought, while some of it may not be. The doc tells the patient, we aren't sure what's making you short of breath at the moment. It could be a heart attack or anxiety or something else. We're going to be doing some tests to make sure it isn't something serious. The nurse then draws some blood for these additional tests. An hour later, the nurse informs the doctor that one of those blood tests is abnormal. The patient has a modest elevation of a heart enzyme called troponin. There are many causes of an elevated troponin, a heart attack being one of the most common. The doctor now thinks to himself, well, yes, the troponin is elevated, and yes, that could be from a heart attack, but it's a very nonspecific test with lots of other explanations. Nothing else really supports this being a heart attack. It's still probably just anxiety. Hopefully, you're able to identify possible anchoring bias, confirmation bias, and momentum bias in that scenario. And maybe there were a few others mixed in there. There's actually more than 20 types of diagnostic biases that have been described, more than we have time to discuss individually. And there are also therapeutic biases. To give you an idea of what a therapeutic bias might be, let's look at two examples. In aggregate bias, the clinician falsely believes that his or her patients are atypical or exceptional, and thus clinical practice guidelines based on aggregate data do not apply to them. And in cluster bias, the clinician errs on the side of providing identical treatment regimens to a cluster of patients who present at the same time with similar but not identical presentations. While the cognitive bias going on in the cartoon was hopefully obvious, sometimes it's not. In fact, it can be incredibly easy to miss or to mischaracterize in real life. To show exactly how easy, I want to discuss a study about how well doctors recognize bias. 37 practicing physicians were recruited using the Society to Improve Diagnosis and Medicine listserv. So these were individuals who were self-selected as physicians specifically interested in clinical reasoning and misdiagnosis. Respondents were reminded of common diagnostic biases just to make sure everyone was on the same page with how the different biases were defined. They were provided written cases which were intentionally constructed to provide diagnostic ambiguity such that roughly half of clinicians in general would say that it was most likely diagnosis X, while the other half would say it was most likely diagnosis Y. And each case included a hypothetical case physician who saw the patient and offered their own diagnosis and treatment plan. Cases concluded with the patient's subsequent outcome. Some of the outcomes were constructed to be consistent with the case physician's diagnosis, and some were inconsistent. So, for example, if a case looked like it could be either a kidney stone or aortic dissection, if the hypothetical case physician treated the patient for a kidney stone, some of the respondents were told that the patient subsequently did fine, while other respondents may have been told the patient collapsed dead in the parking lot as they were heading home from the hospital. For each case, respondents were asked, was a diagnostic error made? If so, did cognitive bias play a role in the error? And if so, what form of bias? The first thing to note about the results is that the number of biases identified in each case depended on whether the outcome was consistent or inconsistent with the case physician's diagnosis. This is one form of hindsight bias, the idea not just that diagnoses are more obvious after the fact, but also if they were missed, a mistake in reasoning was more likely to have been made. Whereas in actuality, you can be impacted by cognitive bias, make a mistake in reasoning, but still get the right diagnosis anyway. What was more interesting than that was how well the respondents agreed on which biases were present, or that is, how well they disagreed. Again, these respondents were self-selected as being interested in misdiagnosis and the reasoning process. And when looking at the kappa value, which is a measure of inter-observer agreement and which varies from negative one to positive one, their level of inter-rater agreement was terrible. The bottom line to the study is that accurately recognizing and classifying bias is hard. So what can we do to combat cognitive bias in medicine? Well, there are several so-called de-biasing strategies. The first is to very deliberately ask, once you already have a working diagnosis, what else could this be? 
irrespective of how obvious the working diagnosis appears. The second is to ask what features of the presentation are not explained by the working diagnosis. For example, if you think that a patient presenting with epigastric pain has peptic ulcer disease, but they also have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, that should make you pause because hepatic and biliary pathologies cause that lab abnormality, not peptic ulcers. Together, these two questions have been referred to as a diagnostic timeout. Another debiasing strategy is to seek a second opinion from a colleague. While they will also be prone to bias, their biases will not be the same as yours. For example, you could present information in a different order than you received it in to minimize the chance that they inappropriately anchor onto the same feature that you might have. And you could not reveal previous working diagnoses that the patient had been given in order to eliminate momentum bias. And the last strategy is a little more vague, metacognition, which is just a fancy word for, for thinking about how we think. The hope is that just by discussing and considering the possibility we are affected by cognitive bias, we may make ourselves a little bit less susceptible to it. Today's key takeaways. At some point in time, most patients will be the recipient of a diagnostic error. A significant number of these diagnostic errors are attributable to cognitive bias. There are many forms of cognitive bias, both diagnostic and therapeutic. Clinicians are inconsistent in the recognition and characterization of bias. And debiasing strategies may help to reduce the impact of bias on clinical reasoning.